I hand over to Rolf Landua. Inviting me, I mean, for our international guests, I, I, I speak in English. Um, well, I have about 30 minutes now to talk about the mission, the research, and the outreach of CERN, which means I have to speed you up a little bit to um, the speed of light, or just below. <clears throat> and I will do that um, in the first um, five minutes. Well, mission means um, that is what we are trying to achieve. And I think that fits very well with um, my previous speaker, Mr. Davis, who has just talked about um, sort of the origin of the universe and the possibilities which we consider nowadays. When CERN was founded, um, we were not that far in our understanding of the universe and the particles. And so it was founded as the European Organization for Nuclear Research. At that time, the nucleus was something still quite mysterious and people tried to find out what was inside and what was inside of the inside. So that was what we call the structure of matter. And of course, the structure of matter is just the question of what are the Lego um, <clears throat> pieces which we try to put together. But you know that in order to put Lego pieces together, you need some kind of clue. And this clue, these are the forces between the particles. And 30, 40 years, people have really concentrated on trying to understand the structure of matter, the pieces, and the glue, which puts these pieces together. Now we think we have understood the recipe. I'll show you in a, mom a moment a little formula which you can put on a t-shirt. And um, you can then say, well, this is sort of what we know about um, matter and forces right now. But it's now also the question, as it just been alluded in the previous speech, where does all that come from? Why like that? What is the origin of the, this matter and these forces? And that goes beyond our original mission. But now first a few words about CERN. In 1949, a European scientist, um, <clears throat> French scientist, De Broglie had the great idea that scientists, um, in contrast to um, nations, should work together, actually. And this idea turned out to become CERN in 1954. Um, after a long period of gestation, it was um, put into Geneva, Switzerland, and it had 12 European member states. Now it has 20, and soon it will have more. And we will go on from there. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a second. This is our main mission. It's building and operating particle accelerators. And the Large Hadron Collider is just the last one in a series of, um, a long series of accelerators which have been built and which were for sometimes always the largest in the world. Of course, um, when you do something with these accelerators, which is um, colliding particles, you also need some kind of cameras in order to look what happens. And these cameras we call detectors, particle detectors. Here you see one of them, and you see this is the Atlas detector, of which you will talk to the spokesperson um, in a few, in two hours or so. And it's a huge camera. I mean, it's not one of your little um, <clears throat> Um, Sony cameras, which you can hold in your hand. Um, it is a 25 meter high, 42 meter long apparatus, which weighs 7,000 tons. And the difference is it can make up to about 40 million pictures a second. Well, CERN is also the host for scientists from the whole world. Counting the nationalities of the scientists, we have 104 different nations involved in CERN's research. And that's in the form of about 10, more than 10,000 scientists from these countries coming to work at CERN. They're not employed by CERN, but they work at CERN. So we provide them with a research tool. And so that is the present situation. So in numbers, we have about 20 member states. Austria, of course, is one of them. Um, we have a candidate for accession, and we have eight observers to the CERN Council. And in 2010, exactly this CERN Council decided that from now on, all countries in the world can, in principle, become CERN member states if they want to. We 
employ about 2,300 staff, most of which are not physicists, which are engineers, technicians, applied physicists, administrators, 790 other paid personnel, temporary contracts, we have a budget of something like a billion Swiss francs, which is paid by the member state according to their um, cross domestic product. So that was basically an introduction to CERN as an <clears throat> institution. Now a few words to the research, but of course you will find out about many of these questions um, much more detailed in a minute. <clears throat> as has been said, the first question was, what is matter made of? We think now that we have found the smallest particles which make our matter. This, these are called the quarks, and these are called the, the electron, its little brother, which is the neutrino. And the big surprise was that apart from the four particles which make up everything which we can see and touch, including um, allowing the sun to shine, which is a neutrino, so that's the first family of quarks and electrons and neutrino. And there are three, two more of these families, which we don't know um, why they are there, but they are part of the Goldilocks universe in some sense. I may repeat this statement. Because if we had, didn't have them, we couldn't explain certain effects, and we believe that they are good for something, but we don't know for what. <laughs> well. Um, then there are the forces, and um, without going into any detail, there are four forces. The strong force, which holds the quarks together in the proton and the neutron, the electromagnetic force, which holds the atoms together, the weak force, which is, can you, you can also call the Harry Potter force, <laughs> because it can change a particle into another particle if you want to, and finally the gravitation, which holds on, uh, on ourselves on the surface of the Earth and keeps the planets going around the sun. And these four forces, um, well, we know their structure, we understand what they are, basically, and we can describe them with certain laws. But the interesting bit is these little numbers which are wrote here on the, on the side, the relative strengths of these forces. And exactly this relative strength, as has been just, just before, is a big mystery. And we are trying to understand the origin of them. Because if they were different, our universe would not be a Goldilocks universe. And finally, if you want your t-shirt, um, you can buy it in the CERN shop, which is part of our outreach activities, actually. And um, you print this formula onto it. You might not understand every single detail, but I can tell you it's kind of a cooking recipe. It's a cooking recipe for making a new universe like that. Some parts we know quite well. These are the upper two lines. And some parts we are just trying to find out. These are the lower two lines, which describe the so-called Higgs mechanism. So we ask ourselves, why this? And why is our universe just like that? What happened in the first trillions of a second of the Big Bang, and which made that the 13.7 billion years up to now have become our universe as we see and like it? So somehow the laws of nature emerged during the Big Bang, and we're trying to find out what is the mechanism. Well. Of course, it looks as if we understand already everything, but that's not true. Just analyzing this picture, which we have just seen, the so-called W map um, distribution of the cosmic microwave background, has shown us that there are 95% of our universe is made of stuff we have no idea what it is. So-called dark energy, which blows up our universe in, in a kind of an accelerated mechanism over the last five to six um, billion years. There's dark matter, which is responsible for the existence, the mere existence of our galaxies. And these two things are basically something which we are trying to understand by doing some experiments in the laboratory. Maybe we find the reason for dark matter. Maybe we find the reason why particles, um, how particles get their mass. That's another big question which philosophers have wondered a long time ago. How can something which we think is a kind of a point um, have an inertia? When you push it, it resists this push. Um, and the solution might be quite a surprising one. It might be that it's not a property of the particle. It might be a property of the space around it. 
And this space may be filled with some mysterious, still mysterious field, which we call the Higgs field, and we're trying to explore that at CERN right now. And this interaction between the originally massless particle and this field, which fills all our space since the time of the Big Bang, or maybe a trillions of a second after the Big Bang, this interaction makes that this particle has a resistance, an inertia. So while you read the newspaper, you will find out how far we have got. And how we do it, while well, we recreate the conditions which are similar to the time of a trillions of a second after the Big Bang. And that we do by accelerating particles to very, very high energy and smashing them together in the middle of these detectors and seeing what happens when they come out. So the accelerator has somehow a du dual purpose. In, in one sense, it's a little bit like um, the Rutherford experiment. You know, you shoot a little projectile on something else and you look how this projectile is scattered and that gives you some idea what is inside this object which you are trying to explore. That's one purpose. But the other one is that you make new particles. Some particles which are not there or only existed um, shortly after the Big Bang. And the study of these newly produced particles, that's what we are doing mainly in the LHC experiment. So CERN has built the tools which are needed in order to do these kind of studies, and you will hear more about that um, in a moment from our director of research. Um, I should just show you one short movie because we are going now in the, t in the direction of our outreach efforts in order to explain what we are doing. And that's just a little movie which shows you um, basically um, the connection between the acceleration of particles, which happened in this accelerator. Every time particles go around, every time particles go around the LHC, 11,000 times a second, they get a little push, and finally um, they hit each other because there are two beams in opposite directions, and they meet in, inside one of the four experiments. And in these collisions, you see we produce new particles. And some of these particles, um, rarely but um, still detectably, uh, will give us some new clues about the origin of the universe. Well, um, of course, the research does not only um, produce new knowledge. It also drives innovation in technology, and it educates young scientists. Well, I mean, an old but still interesting example, I think, is the fact that the World Wide Web was invented at CERN, not in order to make it possible to put your um, holiday photos on, on Facebook. No, it was invented in order that s scientists at the previous accelerator lab could um, sort of communicate with each other and um, produce um, histograms which their colleagues in Japan and the US could see immediately. And then later on, other people found it um, useful too. Um, detector developments, which we are um, doing, of course, in order to um, allow to study these um, um, collisions at very, very high frequency, they are also used in medical diagnostics. So some of the crystals, for example, which we use in the CMS experiment, allow now in the future to have PET scanners, which, were, um, which are much better and much smaller and much higher resolution. Um, in this case, you can, for example, study brains or have tumor diagnostics. New acceleration technologies have led to new therapies for tumor treatment where you use protons and ions from accelerators and you shoot particle beams with very high precision into the part of your body which uh, contains a tumor and um, these methods are very effective. And most likely you don't know that most accelerators in the world are actually not used for research but 10,000 of them are used in hospitals or in, in industry. And so um, this has really been a spin-off of um, particle physics, which has sort of taken a very large range, a very wide range in society. When I speak about education, um, it's not only the education, I would say, of the general public. It's also, of course, the education of young scientists which work at CERN. And um, for example, in the year 2011, we had about 2,500 PhD students in CERN experiments alone. And you see from the distribution of the age of CERN users, of these 10,000 scientists, that the peak 
is really at an early age of 27 years, and only a fraction of these students um, will finally go into academia or into research. They, many of them will go into industry and other fields of society. So this is a brilliant opportunity to learn about um, a very fundamental subject, learn about international collaboration, and have a brilliant education. Also, Austria participates in this program with a, a program for P young PhD students, which come to CERN as doctoral students for um, two or three years, and that has been very successful. Well, now to finish, I will show you a little bit how we are trying to explain all this, which of course you understand mainly when you have studied five years of physics, how we try to um, give you an idea of what we are doing when you come to CERN and you have just two hours or three hours in the afternoon. Well, first of all, what are our visitors? Well, mainly there are two groups, teachers and school students and the general public. And it's of course not like um, this blackboard here, which I've shown, that we are trying to explain science. But we have to explain our science in terms of metaphors, and pictures, and analogies. So one analogy, which, is, uh, which I just want to show you, which is usually quite successful, I tried it on you too, um, is just to um, give you an idea about what we are trying to um, do with these acceleration and with the collisions, you know. What we are trying to do is to produce new particles which we don't know yet. Well, of course, so I say always, well, let's just compare protons with strawberries, okay? So we build a strawberry collider, you know? And then we take Einstein's energy equals mass times C squared and use that in order to explain that energy can become matter. So the kinetic energy of the strawberries can become matter. And as you can see, when we, at the end result of the transformation of energy into new particles, we still have the two strawberries here. But we have other fruit as well. We have a pear, we have bananas, we have a peach, and so on and so forth. That is what we have done in the past, and we know all this fruit salad, that is our standard model, okay? So, what are we interested in? Well, you see it already in the picture, we are interested in this fish here, you know, but because that is something new, that is something which we don't know yet about, and that's maybe this exotic Higgs particle. So anyway, this is just a silly example maybe, but it helps a little bit to visualize what we are trying to do. So, what else do we do in our outreach? Well, to start with the teachers, which for us are very, very important, we um, give them teacher courses. Because teachers are role models, they are multipliers, one single teacher can, uh, will talk to about 1,000 students within the next 10 years, and so he can be a crucial link for bringing modern science into school classes. And we know from experience that these themes which we are trying to explore Antimatter, black holes, dark matter, the theory of everything, the God particle, the Higgs, dark energy, Big Bang, extra dimensions. These are subjects which are really, really interesting for young people. They all want to know more about it. And they never, and that is the interesting bit, associate it actually to the physics lessons at school, because the physics lessons at school are usually discussing physics, which was modern in three or four hundred years ago. So what we tell the teachers is, well, why don't you take your students on a sightseeing tour and show them sort of the beautiful landscape of physics here, you know? Talk about it in a, well, simple way, but make them interested in modern science so maybe they find a good reason why they should continue their scientific studies in higher secondary school, you know? And it's also very important to instill a feeling of mystery and discovery potential, because who would ever study something when um, everything is already known and there's nothing left to be discovered, you know? So all young people, I think, are very enticed by the question of mystery. Well, so the number of teachers we had, we had in these CERN courses has risen drastically over the last four years when we restructured our outreach activities and education group. And so we are now about a thousand teachers per year, which follow about 25 courses in our, um, in our um, courses. Well, of course, then the question arises, what does the teacher now do when he comes back? all enthusiastic and all ready to talk about it. Um, what does he tell his class? So 
this is an example of what we are giving them with. Um, we give them lesson plans, for, for example, for teaching antimatter. And as you can see from the titles, it's not all very serious and very scientific. It's meant to give um, an easy introduction to some aspects of antimatter, scientifically correct, but not too detailed, so that they find for, at the age of 14 and 15, it's probably worthwhile to continue um, listening to the teacher and maybe take um, physics at A levels or at higher levels or whatever. We um, give them posters so they can put them on the wall. On 17 posters, they can have the key concepts of the evolution of matter and the universe from the Big Bang to today. Um, and then, of course, when the teachers have finished the um, courses, they very often come back to CERN with their classes because they want to, sh to share the excitement of the research. So this is the number of visitors we had since um, for the last few years, and if you can see our efforts um, have succeeded. We have um, almost tripled the number of visitors per year. We are now at about 70,000, and about 50% of these visitors are school classes. So what do they do when they come at CERN? Well, first of all, they have an introduction talk, and they go to two visit points, which can be experiments, control rooms, accelerators. We have exhibitions, of which I want to show you one in just a second. And finally, we have a school lab, or will have a school lab, where they can do an additional day, um, 10 experiments on modern ex physics in groups of three under supervision of some guides. Um, so that is one of the exhibitions, and I want to um, close with that um, short preview, which is also, I think, a quite nice um, sort of finishing point because it shows how modern science and its sort of um, <clears throat> mediation um, can also include or should include the most modern um, interactive multimedia technologies that we have and we dispose of. Because since the subjects are really abstract and complicated, um, we need um, impressive and um, really immersive technologies in order to make people sort of um, understand or at least beginning to understand what is happening. So we have um, this exhibition, which you're all welcome to see, uh, where in the center we have um, a short animation which shows collisions between particles. And then we have a touch table where you can um, sort of explore what is under the surface of um, um, the area where CERN is constructed. 100 meter underground, there is the LHC and all the different experiments which are happening there. We have an interactive globe which you can push and you can find out who in the world is um, interacting with, um, uh, is working at CERN, which co collaborations exist, what um, institutes are working in these collaborations. And finally, we have many interactive touch spheres where you can explore more deeply what's happening um, <clears throat> at the LHC, how do detectors work, you can even have a virtual visit, and you can also find um, what um, fundamental research has to do with the technology we are carrying around in our pockets today. So at the very end, I just show you about two minutes extract of a film which we show in the globe and which gives you maybe in two minutes just um, summarizes what my previous speaker has said about the evolution of the universe. This is a little bit like the deep space um, theater which you have here at Ars Electronica. Um, not quite as impressive, but it projects all this on the walls of our globe exhibition and it gives you a little bit of an impression of how we try trying to explain what we are doing.
continues to expand and to cool down. But it takes almost 400,000 years until hydrogen and helium atoms can form. the universe has become transparent. Light from this era can still be seen today as the cosmic background radiation. Gravity begins to pull the hydrogen and helium together. Stars are born. Fusion inside the stars forms heavy nuclei, the base of life. And these building blocks are thrown into space Stars die in giant explosions. After nine billion years, gravity pulls some of these remnants together to form our solar system with our planet Earth, where evolution gives rise to life, intelligence, and consciousness. Thank you very much for your attention.